You got to press the, the skinny one to the screen. Y'all hear me? There we go. Uh, thank the chairman. Thanks for hosting this. Uh, thanks for Heritage Foundation for hosting this. Thanks for uh, our uh, great witnesses. Uh, Governor, I assume that you're at least watching uh, Aggie baseball right now, the 3 0 lead. Uh, top, top of the fourth. Top of the <laughs> I, I knew I could rely on you, sir. Um, well, it's good good to see my my former boss and my and my dear friend uh, from Texas. Um, I, look, I'm going to be uh, pretty quick and just one thing that I think is critically important here as we look at what's going on and we look at Texas, and the governor knows this better than anybody. Um, you know, Texas is sitting on an ocean of uh, natural resources that the good Lord bestowed upon us. And yet Texas currently is finding itself in the precarious position of, uh, frankly, now increasingly over-reliance on subsidized um, uh, so-called renewable energy. Uh, the question I'd have for the panel is what can you tell us about the inflationary pressure? I know the governor opened with some of that uh, earlier. Um, the inflationary pressure that we're seeing with respect to uh, that reliance, what's happening because of the subsidies that are going in to prop up uh, so-called renewable energy at the expense of fossil fuels and at the expense of nuclear. And what marginal benefit is that giving us to society when you consider that coal-fired plants, China has about 1,100 of them. The United States has about 250. China is putting out about one new coal-fired plant a week. And we, in Texas right now, in our current pipeline, so to speak, of what we're producing for uh, new energy coming online, uh, it's something in the order of 75-ish percent or 80 percent uh, solar, wind, uh, battery, et cetera, and uh, very little in the way of gas-powered and zero nuclear. Uh, so that's a general question for the panel. If you just keep it quick, uh, especially I'll start with the uh, uh, you know economist in the room, just a quick answer on the inflation front. And then to uh, the three, the governor and, and Kathleen and to my friend Alex uh, about, you know, what that's doing to our actual ability to produce energy that's reliable for our grid. When you have in Texas, for example, a week, two weeks ago, where we had a 17 percent production out of our wind farms on a windless day. Just very quickly, uh, do you have a total emission? And Texas ran out of energy and you, your uh, your. Uh, electric power supply shut down. Say that again. Texas ran out of yeah, energy. Exactly. Okay, That's <laughs> just what I was yeah. going to say. I, this is not original to me, but some, somebody said that, you know, for Texas to run out of energy is like Alaska running out of ice. Right. And so this, this is, but I, I was just going to make one quick point and then turn it over to the rest. One of the things that I think is most worrisome right now, and these are state policies, these renewable energy requirements that are being ratcheted up every right. year. Uh, there are now estimates that 20 states could be, my, including my home state of Illinois, are looking at brownouts and blackouts. I mean, my God, what are we, a third world country we're, that we're having, uh, we're running out of electric power? And it's almost entirely attributable to um, renewable energy mandates. Kathleen, do you have something on that, on this subject or no? We've got to... Not in particular. Okay. Um, Governor or Alex, I mean, I'm just trying to get to the heart of, you know, looking at Texas as the model where, Governor, I know we're working on trying to make sure that Texas was leading into uh, having all available options for energy, but now we've got this subsidized form that is undermining our production of fossil fuels, and we have decreasing amounts of fossil fuel generator nuclear power to be reliable there for baseload capacity, which is causing pressure on the grid in terms of electricity availability and driving prices up. Uh, and I wonder if you've got thoughts on that, or Alex, if you do as well. Yeah. Well, Chip, uh, when we um, when we were working on diversifying the Texas uh, power portfolio back in the early 2000s, uh, natural gas had gone to $14 in MCF. Uh, we were almost exclusively relying upon old, uh, inefficient coal plants and uh, natural gas plants, which, and again, at $14 in uh, an MCF, you start looking around for some options. Uh, wind was one of those. Uh, we were uh, we were some of the real leaders. Matter of fact, we became the number one wind producing state in the nation over the next decade. Uh, but our goal, I think, our, our our initial goal was to be um, like if we could have gotten to 15 percent of our total portfolio with renewables, uh, we thought that was going to be uh, really hitting the mark. Well, we blew past that and I, th I think people just I think people took their eye off of the baseload issue 
and 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 I want to I, I want to make a, a little bit of a uh, of a deflection here and talk about what I think the answer in the future is because that's what this this hearing is about. It's not about any mistakes that were made in the past. I mean that that is what it is. What can we do to quickly or as with as the most expeditious way that we can to get base load uh, on our grid so that when the wind quits blowing and the sun does not shine, uh, you're going to be able to keep the lights on no matter where you live in this country. And the idea that we have loss of power in America today is just crazy, Alex. I mean, your, uh, your point with, uh, you know, fossil fuels are going to be a part of keeping the lights on. And if, and if you are 20, what is it, uh, carbon free in uh, 2050 or uh, net zero in 2050, that is a death sentence for literally billions of people around the world. And, and the moral issue here is one that I think we need to talk about. But the way you address it, I think, is permitting has historically been, uh, and regulations, uh, which are one and the same, that's been the real issue and uh, across the board. You know, Chip, as we talked about, how do you put in place a state uh, governance so that your people can flourish? Well, you don't overtax them. You don't overregulate them, you don't overlitigate them, and you have a skilled workforce, i.e., a countable public schools. Those are the four things that you have to do. So, if you have regulations in place, the, the federal government basically has said to America, you're not going to build any more nuclear power, period. Not small modular, not anything, because we're going to regulate you into oblivion. Well, I hope when you take over Congress uh, in January uh, that one of the things that we really look at as a country is how do we streamline the nuclear uh, industry's uh, ability to put these particularly small modular reactors. I think advanced reactors walk away safe. They're economical now. Go. I mean, to me, the real answer is to having regulatory reform where you don't have these basically uh, the big blockade that says, sorry, you're not going to have nuclear power in the country. Governor, thank you. It's, to me, that's the real answer. Thanks for, thanks for that, Governor.